let's start with the introduction, although Shulalitha doesn't require any introduction, to be honest. Um, uh, Dr. Shulalit Bondobadhyay is a 2006 JB scholar. Uh, he is currently an associate professor of particle engineering and hydrometallurgy at the Department of Chemical Engineering, NTNU, Norway. He is also affiliated with TU Delft, Netherlands, as a researcher. He is currently the center manager for the recently established Particle Engineering Research Center. He is also the CTO and co-founder of Live Scientific a biotech startup with a vision of providing fast and sensitive nanoparticle-based nucleic acid extraction for life science and diagnostics. A little bit about his background, because that kind of leads us to the story of today's talk. Um, he graduated with a BE honors in chemical engineering from Jadapur University, India. He was awarded the Erasmus Mundus Fellowship to do his MSc in chemical engineering at NTNU Norway and ETH Zurich, Switzerland. He received the Research Council of Norway's Innovation Prize 2021, NTNU Employee Award for Innovation and Collaboration for 2020, 2018 to 2021, and Innovator of the Year 2020, also the DAAD Scholarship 2009. His research interests include synthesis, characterization, and functionalization of nanoparticles with application, applications in nanomedicine, hydrological tracing, water management, modeling of nanosystems, recycling of lithium ion batteries, and so on. He played a pioneering role in developing NTNU's COVID-19 test kit in early 2020. He contributed to the magnetic bead technology and the subsequent large-scale production that led to his uh, establishment, to the establishment of his startup, Live Scientific. Um, apart from all these, I should also say that Professor Bondobadai has played a very important role for us at JBS PDF. He has always encouraged our efforts and taken part actively. I'm sure that you have watched his talk on how to give an effective presentation on our YouTube channel. Professor Bondobadai, our own Shulalitha, thank you so much. We are so delighted to have you with us today. Um, we are very eager to know the story of your journey through PhD, uh, research, innovation, and then now startup. Thank you so much. Thank you, Orgo, for a very kind introduction. I think uh, said everything that I wanted to say in the first few slides. So I will uh, share the presentation and just see if this works all right. Yes, I can see your presentation. Yeah. Thank you and uh, good afternoon from here in Norway, but also good evening in India for those of you and all over the world, wherever you are. So uh, I have uh, decided in this uh, small talk to discuss a bit about how one can uh, take laboratory research to innovation. And uh, as the title of this talk uh, goes on, I would share with you my own personal experience in how we took laboratory research to innovation and how the journey still continues in a startup. So without uh, going into much more introduction about uh, myself, I would probably just start saying a bit about the history uh, that led to this uh, series of incidents and also how it stands now. So, uh, this was around the middle of March. Uh, Norway was in lockdown on the, on the 15th of March, uh, 12 to 15th in that time. And it's, it started with a sudden uh, round of closures of different uh, organizations and the institutes and also our university, which is Norwegian University of Science Technology. And there was, there was a lot of uncertainty around that, not knowing what a lockdown was actually meaning, what things were. And uh, of course it affected everyone uh, like it did all over the world, the pandemic. But at that point, hardly it was known that it would be such a pandemic all over. But within a very few days, it was around 23rd of March, which was a Monday evening, that there was uh, an email 
that was circulating kind of as an SOS or an emergency email that came from the local hospital here in Trondheim, the St. Olaf's Hospital, that they were requiring this text, uh, excuse me, this is in Norwegian, but what it says is that they were uh, requiring extraction reagents for RNA extraction. And this was a late night email that also popped into uh, one of the uh, one of our group leaders uh, email box and I, I received this email at the same time saying that okay there is a shortage of uh, kits in Trondheim we are a small town approximately around 200,000 people living in this town and there is one uh, big hospital that caters to the whole population and uh, so we thought that the, the email said that we needed reagents. And the reason this email ended into my mailbox is primarily because I have been working with uh, magnetic nanoparticles for quite some time now. And during 23rd March, 2020, I was actually a postdoc at the department. So it came out as an email. And the immediate questions that I started asking myself is that, do we have chemicals? Do we have methods or particles that probably can be uh, given as a starting point to start testing uh, in, in, in a diagnostic lab. And throughout, until then, uh, my research has been within using nanoparticles for different biomedical applications, but hardly did I know that this, uh, this email would change the course of action and how things are going to follow in the next few weeks. The other question that I had was just uh, two weeks back, just before the lockdown, I was actually giving a lecture for the Norwegian Chemical Society uh, and they had a, a lecture series where I was talking about iron oxide coated with uh, silica as sand particles that we have been using as hydrological tracers in, in projects with the Netherlands in TU Delft. And the immediate thought that came to my mind, can we somehow reuse those particles from other applications? Because that might be an easy way out. We already have some particles that can be tested. And then the big question that came up, what volumes are we talking about? Are we talking about testing the whole population of Trondheim? Uh, that is not going to be easy. If anyone in this audience today has been working in the nanotechnology field would know very well that scale up is not an easy thing to do. Also in other fields, but specifically in nanoscience. So th this was a big question about what volumes are we talking about? And then how fast do we need to make these particles? And, and these are the reasons I put up these questions now is that these were also the questions that kind of, you, you do not necessarily ask when you are in a laboratory setting because there you have mostly a research project which runs for a certain period of time and, and, and uh, there is not so much of a speed or urgency. But this was an emergency email it was, uh, it meant healthcare facilities. So there was already an urgency to that. And as many of you might know that healthcare products, especially diagnostic kits are not easy to get approved for use. So these questions started coming up. And what we had luckily was that we already had some protocols in our, uh, in our team where we could make small scale batches. Now, as I show you on this little uh, small vial, as we call it, uh, with particles sticking towards the magnet, this was enough, as we learned over the next few weeks, to do some thousand tests. So we were already kind of in the business, but this method had its own challenges because it, uh, we didn't need all components or all parts of this method. So we, this was our starting point. This was March, end of March, uh, 24th of March when we started going into the labs and uh, eventually I pulled in one of my PhD students uh, who was uh, at that point kind of in his uh, towards the end of his PhD and we went into the lab and started making some particles and the big question that came up is how do we scale up because within a few days we got to know that we are talking about hundred thousands someone was telling we were talking about half a million and there were also uh, information going on that it's not only a scarcity in Trondheim, but the big cities, bigger cities like Oslo, like Stavanger, they were also having shortages of kits. So we were already in the 
thought process, how are we going to scale up this? Do we have enough resources? Everything was in a lockdown. Labs had been shut down, uh, PhDs, postdocs, everyone else was kind of on the, at that point, there was a planning going on who would be able to come back to the labs, what's the urgency, the managers were chalking out, engineers were not there on, on, on campus. So th these were the obvious questions. If we need to make something, there was in general a crisis all around. Do we have labs? Yes, we started first in uh, a small, a smaller lab, but guessing that there would be a need for scale up, we started thinking, where are we going to move? Because these reactions do require, for those of you who work with chemistry or chemical engineering or materials, we, we need fume hoods because we are using organic solvents in parts of the reaction, meaning that we needed proper lab facilities. And then the big question was that, how do we facilitate this? As I said, my role at that point in the university was as a postdoc with also limited, um, uh, limited knowledge about several uh, administrative functions in the university. And then the big question was that we have never used it for biodiagnostics. We have never used it. A diagnosis for, of coronavirus was even far away. We had never used it for biodiagnostics, these products. So will these at all work for our applications? And the biggest thing was that the, we, we even didn't know who our collaborators were on the other side. In general, in a research project, you would specifically uh, set up uh, collaboration with people whom you have interacted before or whom you know from other, other sources. But here, we just had a telephonic call and they said, if you have some particles, we can test it out and the hospital will be able to give us some patient samples straight away. And then we started talking out what are the obstacles. So there were obstacles not only at getting, if you will be able to scale up, these are more technical and scientific obstacles, but also practical obstacles. If we need chemicals, where do we get those? Because a research lab is not used to production facilities. It's more used to making uh, small volumes and more, more or less uh, fun experiments knowledge development experiments. So do, would we get chemicals? Would we get people? Would we get labs? All the questions started popping up. And at the same time, we had to get these products made uh, and get tested. And this is a picture from the mid-April. So I was talking about end of March. And within mid-April, we were able to go into a full-scale production in the university labs. I show you the three or four groups that were working. We immediately realized that it's Corona times. So many people can get uh, affected or can, be, uh, can contract the virus. So we needed to have a robust production. So we set up two production lines and a quality control line all at our department of chemical engineering. Whereas at the laboratory center, which is the diagnostic uh, lab and uh, the department of clinical and molecular medicine, that set up the buffer production on their side. And this is where we went from a small vial uh, producing 1,000 tests to a mid-April full-scale production where we were able to churn out more than 150,000 tests a week already in mid of April. So things happen very fast. And uh, this is a, another uh, production line uh, picture from around the same time. Uh, and uh, we were able to bring in the people who were actually not able to come back to the lab. So mostly our startups were uh, the master students working with me at that point, PhDs uh, and postdocs, my office mates, for example. And we just called them and can, can you lend a hand? Because everything started as a voluntary activity uh, because we, no one had an idea of what scales it would go to. So then just to kind of give you a quick timeline of how the events happened. And uh, so 20th of March, the NTNU, the, the email came from the hospital to NTNU regarding extraction kits. The first two or three days, the Department of Clinical and Molecular Medicine, they did some tests, but they didn't use any magnetic beads. And they realized that without magnetic separation, if you're talking about high throughput testing, this is not going to work. So 23rd of March, we get contacted, our department for magnetic beads. 24th to 27th of March, that is already uh, a weekend, these magnetic beads were produced and tested in the hospital. It was very intensive, almost 24 seven 
working hours this particular week. And the results started coming in over the weekend. The hospital was extremely happy with the quality of the beads. And believe me, I would, when I recall that moment or those discussions, I still feel that the product we had in the first phase was, uh, if, if it was a researcher or a scientist really working for it, it was not even at the state you would like to call it a product, but it was working. And that's a very, very important realization that sometimes we spend years trying to you know, shift the domain of knowledge by a little bit. But if you take that product out to an application and get it tested, you might see that your product is already of a good uh, quality. And then 27th to 29th March, there were large scale experiments that were done at the hospital labs where patient samples that were being, uh, that were being received in the hospital were directly used for testing our beads and the bu buffer. And 1st of April, we established contact with the health authorities in Norway regarding approval, because without the approval, this cannot be used as a diagnostic product. And guess what? 3rd of April, uh, the technology transfer office already, when the news came out on national media on, on 1st of April, the technology transfer office contacted us and said that this is something you need to file a patent because otherwise there would be an unethical use of the technology. So the patent filing was primarily to stop misuse of the technology since there was a shortage of kits. The industrial partners uh, all over the world, they were struggling to produce enough test kits at that point. So we filed two patents in the UK and in Norway. And then 17th of April, NTNU method was approved. So it was a very fast approval, uh, as you can see. And if you look at the timeline, then within less than one month, we were able to take a product from the research labs into an innovation and got it tested in a healthcare facility. So this was less than one month, which is, uh, which is also a measure of the fact that there was a, there was, this was driven very much by the urgency at hand. And then finally, on the 17th of May, we signed agreement with the Norwegian health authorities, and we were asked to produce 5.1 million uh, test kits for the whole of Norway. And those were the test kits that have been used uh, all throughout for the testing of Corona in Norway, especially, and it continues still in Oslo uh, area and in Trondheim, whereas the other uh, cities have resorted to other means as well. So then what I'm going to tell you a bit more is how this uh, test works and what our contribution has been before I take you to the journey further. So as I said, we were making these magnetic beads uh, in our department. And in that process, we use metal precursors or metal salts, which are then reduced. And when you reduce them, you end up in the formation of iron oxide nanoparticles. So these are super paramagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles, which in a second step, we do a silica coating. We can, you can imagine that this is a layer of sand. So our magnetic beads then are nanoparticles, which are basically silica coated iron oxide nanoparticles. And just to give you an image without the scale bar for uh, obvious reasons, uh, these are how the first generation of particles looked like. So they were mostly spherical, but you also had other forms in, in these images. And then we were able to vary the type of beads that one would like. So on the left side of your screen, you can see they're more uh, spread out. They're not ag agglomerated. On the right side, you see they're agglomerated. So we, we tried playing around and we had a huge pool of people. So if you can imagine it's a factory that was set up inside a university with minds that wanted to explore more. So we could run a small R&D department already within the project. And I'll come back to that in a while. So before I move on, I will show you a small video of how the test actually
So that was how the test works, and it is quite similar to other uh, RT-PCR tests that have been used widely during the pandemic and are still in use. And our contribution on this test has been on the magnetic beads. So where I now take you to is to kind of understand uh, the challenges that we had in establishing a factory within a university. And uh, we were already producing 150,000 COVID-19 tests per week. This is a, one of the labs where the production started, but we realized that, that there was not enough uh, available space to continue or expand the production. So we started kind of searching for more lab space, transforming old uh, labs which were not in use into labs you could use. And honestly, it was a lot of help from large number of people, starting from administration at the department, to administration at the faculty up till the rector level or central people, glass workshops, metal workshops, making the reactors where we run these reactions. Uh, and there are, there are a lot of stories that one I could relate back to those times. So, but the main point that I want to say is that there was enormous help around this journey. And me, myself, having, a, have, having had very little industrial experience uh, in, in, in such production, also needed to you know, quickly change the ways you think from being a researcher into working more or less into a factory, managing the whole production. So we set up this production diagrams. It basically shows you a flow of uh, the, uh, the, the, the events that happened. So we started uh, with the production of the iron oxide nanoparticles. And then the next day, the iron oxide nanoparticles were characterized and quality controlled. Once they were okay, these went into a selenization process where the magnetic beads were produced. And then the next day, the production of the beads was complete. They were characterized. And on the same day, the results were logged. And the next day, so you see, we are already on day three where the quality control of the beads were done. And this is an elaborate process. Uh, at every step, there were a lot of checks that were needed to ensure that all the products met the same quality. And once we were happy with the quality control of the magnetic beads, these were bottled. And once they were bottled, they were sent to the Department of Clinical and Molecular Medicine, which then produced the buffer. And both of these beads and the buffer combination were then tested uh, together if they were performing well, and then sent over to the hospitals and the clinics that were using it. So this was an elaborate process and needed uh, planning. And these are some of the production volumes to show. So until uh, we started in April and the production volumes picked up and until November, we produced more than 20 million uh, test kits using the laboratory facilities in NTNU. And out of that, almost, I'll show you the numbers later, almost 10 to 11 million test kits have been sold now by the startup. Uh, the previous were already in agreements with health authorities in Norway, in Denmark, in Brazil, in India, and close to 250 organizations have been in contact where they tried to take our method all over the world. Uh, and there were evening uh, meetings, there were meetings with philanthropists, there were, it was an exciting uh, six to nine months when we had to have translators because some of them could not speak English. So we had translators in the meeting trying to understand what they need. And we learned a lot. So did we also understand that uh, the challenges were all over the world. And very briefly, without giving too much details on the scientific part today, but I wanted to give or show at least two uh, results that were kind of self-comforting when we had this. So this is from the very first data set that I mentioned around the 27th, 29th of March, the last week of March, where our method, which is then the Hamilton NTNU method, was compared with the state of the art, which is MagnaPure or Roche method. And uh, one thing to notice here is that our method used 100 microliter of the patient sample, whereas generally in the diagnostics you use 200 microliter. And you can see a very good match between the yellow and the black bars. So this was a 180 case study, very uh, high compliance and reproducible and repeatable. And this is where our journey started. And then we didn't give up because we found that our test method was much more sensitive than anything available in the market at that point. 
So we also did this uh, sensitivity tests or analysis. Uh, the, on your y-axis, you can see the CT values and the CT values, I think many of you are now aware of, it basically gives you a concentration of the virus or the viral load. The lower the value of CT, that means you have a higher viral load. And using our method, we were able to develop and sense one to three copies of viral RNA, which is very, very sensitive. And it's also linear at uh, low titers of virus and the linearity is a very important feature of such diagnostic tests. And we also show batch-to-batch -batch reproducibility, as you can see between the four batches shown in this uh, figure. And, uh, and we are pretty sure that these are uh, very reproducible since we have produced uh, close to 20 million tests and all of them passed the quality uh, control criteria before they were uh, shipped to the hospitals. So very briefly summarizing the uniqueness is that where we had the innovation in this aspect was the scaling up. So the reactions themselves could have been done in small vials, but that was not possible. Where we had innovation on our side was the scalability and how do we scale up the process. It has been implemented in all Norwegian hospitals, the major ones for COVID-19 diagnostics since early April 2020, which also gives you an indication of how much patient data we have for these beads. It's compatible with open robotic platforms. And this was the beauty of this method. We tested it on uh, Kingfisher from Thermo Fisher, Taycan, Hamilton, and Biomech robots. And, and what it gave us also in the later on is that we had protocols that you can uh, give to these, uh, to, the, to the diagnostic labs that run one of these robots. And this was extremely useful for uh, promoting the test. And we have tested now, and also during those hectic days that we can isolate RNA or DNA, not only from coronavirus, but also from other pathogens, other starting materials. Initially, everything was done with this nasopharyngeal swab, but it can also be done in sputum. It can be tested in urine as well. And two patents were filed in two countries. And before moving on further to the startup, I want to kind of also let you know that the startup was one of the three important things that came out as a result of this research and innovation. The first of all was it led to the nucleation of a, a particle engineering center uh, in 2021, which I'm currently leading as the uh, center manager. And what we found out is that the university in general will not continue producing these beads. But we have learned quite a lot in the process of production, quite a lot in taking research into innovation and into society. So all this knowledge needed to be continued at a university level, but not through production. So therefore, when, when uh, these sales happened, the working with the central authorities and the faculty and the department, we established a mechanism through which most of this sales revenue could then come back to uh, furthering more research in this direction and hence, this center was set up with an overall goal to advance both the scientific and the technical knowledge within fundamental applied particle engineering. We have two main objectives. The first one is that we want to keep using our chemical engineering skill sets and advance the field of particle engineering. So from fundamental studies to research studies. On the other hand, we also want to establish a strong collaborative platform based on sustainability framework with industrial partners. And this is where the particle engineering center is now functioning. And we have already expanded within one and a half years, the portfolio of projects that run within the particle engineering center. Currently we are focusing on uh, nanomedicine as one area of research and environmental applications as the other area of research. And just to kind of give you an, a sense that the particle design and character characterization are still kind of the foundation of the different application areas. So very briefly within nanomedicine, we are looking at different applications such as biosensing, diagnostics, therapeutics, imaging. Whereas in the environmental applications, we look at water management, battery recycling, carbon dioxide capture, anti-fouling, photocatalysis. So these are just some areas where the particle center is currently having at least one PhD student. The second thing that we also got as a result of this research and innovation was that we 
set up a particle engineering core facility or an area or invest, investment of equipments that were basically purchased during the Corona project to aid the process of both production as well as research and development. Now these equipments have now been put under a core facility, opened up for everyone to use, not only the university, but also for external actors, of course, uh, at, a, for, at different rates for usage. But this helps us to then do high scale and high end characterization of nano and microparticles in dispersion, also look at elemental samples, so on and so forth. The third thing that happened, and that is what I'm going to talk to you for the next or for the rest of this uh, lecture, is the establishment of the startup, which is Live Scientific. So our main approach in Live Scientific is to have or produce high quality life science and diagnostic applications or solutions. So the start, of course, was from the Corona project, but our vision is primarily to be a a uh, premier provider of high quality life science research. And much of the work goes on on nucleic acid extraction at this point in time, but we are fast expanding into other kinds of uh, applications, including genome sequencing, next generation sequencing, uh, chip-based technologies, et cetera. And uh, we, what we have seen throughout the, uh, throughout the pandemic, is that we are able to uh, perform at this uh, or with this space primarily because we have two important components. One is the beads. We have full control of how to control or how to produce these beads, how to surface uh, engineer these beads. And on the other side, we have the experience of working with lysis buffer. Professor Magna Buros, who is the counterpart on the buffer and extraction side, has more than 30 years of experience in the diagnostic field. So combining these two, we have seen that our business model is primarily uh, to, to sell the kits directly. So we want to keep the production uh, to, to live. We have not discussed about licensing the technology, also the, although this has been discussed widely during the Corona project. But currently our model is to do both, uh, to, to mostly attack the market in terms of disruptive pricing. We are also very much interested in collaborating with diagnostic labs all around the world. And I'll come back to that in, later on. So as you see, the team has now expanded. Uh, we have uh, found founders uh, who are also part of the board. So I am, uh, I'm working as a CTO. Uh, Tonya is the CEO and she was also then the business developer during the Corona project, she was working in the technology transfer office and then moved into this company. We also have Morten Wickstall, who has, is the chairman of the board and has a very strong experience uh, within the segment sample preparation. He has been part of various startups uh, and including uh, has been working in this Dynal technologies, which is the Thermo Fisher uh, beads. And for some of you, you might know that the origin of this beads that Thermo Fisher uses for magnetic separation all around the world is actually in Norway, stemming from the same research environment, uh, also NTNU, uh, the Ugelstad beads, as they call it, the Ugelstad technology. So therefore, we have a very much, very strong background in, in, in particles as well. And then Magnar and me are uh, working in the company now, as well as our NTNU positions. And then we have hired new people for production and laboratory, uh, laboratory studies. So the technology, uh, the current technology is magnetic particle based uh, with automation platforms, but where we are expanding is to use the same beads and buffer for a variety of viruses. So it was only for coronavirus, but we are now in the process of launching a new product that can take care of many viruses with the same uh, same products, but with different protocols. And our long-term ambition is to develop an integrated system. So where we also want to provide the automation part along with our products. Now, currently this is how our products look like. So these are two bottles, one bottle that contains a colorless solution that is the buffer, which opens up the virus. And then once the virus is opened, you add the beads and the name of the company comes from Lysis and beads. That's why we call ourselves Live Scientific. 
And our first product is Nuxtra, which has been used uh, or it's available for in different, uh, in different volume sizes, depending upon uh, the customers. But what we are very much proud in uh, promoting is that this is a fast and cheap method. Our current analysis time is down to 12 minutes from when we started during the pandemic, it was 35 minutes. And for any of you who have a diagnostic background would need me would know that taking it from 30 minutes to 12 minutes uh, is a huge boost in, in a diagnostic setting. And where we are looking at future products, we're looking at respiratory diseases, uh, which are almost in the pipeline now and uh, soon to be launched. Uh, and sexually transmitted diseases, and then personalized medicine. That's where we are heading. And uh, the reason I put this up is that this is an excellent platform for, for using the R&D powerhouse that we have at NTNU to create new products and through a proper licensing mechanism, have these products reach the society through life scientific. So that is kind of the mechanism that we now believe in. So our business model is to sell reagents and kits, and there are two most important areas. We are looking at selling it to clinical laboratories and academic research labs. And the second one is that we're looking for more business to business distribution, which is industrial partners. And here we are looking at finding distributors and uh, working with distributors is not easy, but however, this work is mostly then taken care of by the CEO of our company. And we are still uh, with a patent application pending. So the national phase patent uh, will be filed in October this year. And this is just to give you an idea that uh, we are pretty uh, close to getting this patent accepted now. It's a long process. It started in 2020 uh, and hopefully it would be accepted pretty soon. The best thing that we have got after moving from uh, NTNU to Life Scientific is that we have our whole quality management system uh, ISO certified. So we have ISO 13485, uh, the general CE, CE marking, which was a challenge for many countries that they could not take in the products even during the Corona times. And when we were trying to sell it from the university, we have now overcome that uh, as soon as Life Scientific was established. And we are also, since there is a new change in the IVDR uh, uh, rules, we are also looking at harmonizing with what is existing. So this is again to show that we have a patent pending, but at the same time, we have a good quality management system. And what I would like to stress very much is that the research infrastructure that supports LIBE. So we have the Department of Clinical and Molecular Medicine where Professor Magna Buras carries out basic clinical and translate, translational research, cancer research, genome dynamics, infectious diseases, and then we at the Department of Chemical Engineering, which is the home of this Ugelstad beads and a strong competence with magnetic nanoparticles and scale-up processes. And this gives rise to a, a strong R&D powerhouse as we see it, that has uh, almost like 50 to 80 researchers working on different technologies. And then we are in a process of scouting some of the front runners and licensing them to our own startup. So this is the, this is how the mechanism that we dream of. So very briefly about LIBE's journey then, we have sold close to 10, 10 million units. And for a startup in the first year to earn revenue is already a very advantageous situation. So we had positive income in the first year. Our first product is CIVD marked. We have a very fast protocol. That's our competitive edge as well. 12 minutes on Thermo Fisher's Kingfisher, and we have already implemented and they are being used in several of our customers on various robots. So it's easy to uh, uh, piggyback on those customers and expand the customer base. And at the same time, we have a huge data set from the Norwegian hospitals, which is our uh, strongest approver, uh, where these have been used now for more than two years. And we have a robust in-house production. We have set up a new production facility now within Life Scientific, and we are starting on our second, second type of product, uh, competitive on price. And the most important thing is that we have also got some, secured some soft funding, close to 20 million kroners for commercial and R&D activities, but also carrying on research. So currently we have three, uh, two PhDs and one uh, researcher who are working exclusively 
on a research council of Norway funded project, which is owned by Life Scientific, but the research work goes on in NTNU. So it's a very nice funding mechanism where the company applies, but uh, the research can happen both in the company as well as in the university. And as always, we are seeking for strategic collaboration partners for supply of kit and magnetic particles, and there are new leads coming in. Now, these are some of the milestones. So again, as a company, as a startup company, what I would like to show here is that we had a very uh, fast journey. Uh, the April <coughs> is when we filed the patent. And then until December 2020, 5.1 million test kits were already sold. <coughs> and most of this was then done uh, through NTNU. And then Nuxtra started its sales from August, September, 2020 to Denmark, to India, to Brazil. 27th of January, 2021, the company was officially founded. And already within the half of uh, 2021, we had secured enough funding because this company is now <coughs> used very much as an example by, by both the technology transfer office and also the innovation department of the university, because this is an instance of uh, achievement for from different aspects, not only from a research side, not only from innovation side, but also how you can uh, uh, mobilize administrative functions during such a pandemic. And in January 2022, we had new sales to Norwegian hospitals. We have also been selling kits to Nepal. NTNU had uh, uh, given a Christmas gift to Nepal every year. NTNU decides for a Christmas gift to countries and then uh, this, uh, in 2021, this was to Nepal, and then Nepal came back again to buy more weeds. So there we are using it absolutely manually. Uh, so it's equally valid for manual extraction. And we are now working on Q QMS compliance. And uh, mid of this year is our plan to launch our respiratory viruses and for sexually transmitted diseases, the next product. So looking back at what has happened and kind of giving you an overview now of why we feel that this was a success and where research comes in, where innovation comes in. The first important thing that I think was crucial was the initiative. And this I keep saying because at that point, all of us joined into the project more as a voluntary service. And there was no compulsion, there was no mandate, but the social mandate was very strong. That's why we came into the project. And if you have a right initiative, if you know an application that you want to solve, that's the first, the first step to innovation. The second thing that you need is support, including what uh, you are listening to today, but also there is a need for an environment that supports innovation. And this is uh, very less realized in various universities because it seems like uh, for many universities and having talked to several people now, what I feel is that innovation is seen to be a very, uh, something which is kind of, you know, saved and preserved. But innovation in this case was a little tuning of existing methods, but the upscaling part, which became an innovation. So what, what my suggestion to many of you would be is that do not restrict yourself in interpreting what innovation is but try to channelize your research thoughts into or through innovation. And I guess the best advice that I can give you is that all universities have a tech transfer office in some form or the other. And just to get to know them, just to know what they're working on, how they give you support and how they make you realize your innovation potential is, is very, very interesting and very important to do. Take it step by step. Uh, for us, whether we would be able to produce a small batch that can be validated in the diagnostic test was our first step. And then the second step was to see if we can scale it up. And if, we, if I now think back and say that if I had started the scaling up process before the product getting validated, then maybe we would have lost a lot of resources. So it's very important to think logically about your innovation idea and always to have a proof of concept before you take it further for scaling up. You should be ambitious. And this is very important because I remember those initial days when I, I, I myself didn't realize that this was an innovation, to be honest. And when I started discussing with people from another department, the Department of Clinical and Molecular Medicine, I was made to realize 
that this is a huge innovation because for me it seemed like it's one of the uh, various types of nanoparticles that we actually make in our uh, daily routine so how can this you know change the whole landscape but it was the case because we had high ambitions and the ambition was that not only to help uh, the local hospital survive through this pandemic but to expand it nationally Con uh, con contacting the health authorities, contacting health authorities in other countries proactively and offering help. Uh, these are all part of having high ambitions. The other thing that I keep discussing is interdisciplinary collaboration. This project wouldn't have been successful without this interdisciplinary approach that we took. And as I said, I didn't know about the collaborators and it's, it's a very funny story that one can share is that when we had our first uh, national uh, or the national TV coming into our labs, trying to take a picture of what's going on, I was surprised to see uh, Professor Magna Bureau at that point because I had never met him before that. And in the lab, I, I asked people, uh, who is this person? So that, that was the kind of collaboration trust that we had, but both of us, and we still do understand one another. We do not understand one another's field in complete but we understand the purpose of it. And I think that is very, uh, very basic and it's enough for to start an interdisciplinary collaboration. And the research expertise also plays a lot of role. There is a lot of discussion and recently we have been in discussion with the Research Council of Norway, trying to figure out what basic research has contributed to this innovation activities. And you won't believe me that after doing this mapping, we have been able to found, find out that several of the research projects, fundamental science research projects that have been funded by the Research Council and also the Horizon 2020 program, for example, have been a, a, a great impetus to the work that was through the Corona project. So without basic science, without basic research, and without great researchers who are listening in today, uh, such an innovation is not possible. And finally, network. And this is very important to know the right people, to take help from the right people at the right time. So if you have an idea which you think, which you are struggling to know if this is innovative or not, take a chat with your tech transfer office and try to get it evaluated because no idea uh, needs to be thrown out. It's only an idea which is premature or a mature idea. And, and people, if you are in the right network, they can help you. Uh, to mature ideas. So now what we have become in, in my research team, and also the fourth thing that I didn't mention that I moved from a postdoc into an associate professor uh, due to all these developments around. Uh, but in, in our team, we have a very strong innovation culture where every semester we have regular meetings with the, with the tech transfer office, charting out where are the potential uh, patent processes that can go on, where are uh, kind of innovation threats in the sense that what we have already disclosed and what is already covered by different NDA, uh, non-disclosure agreements, et cetera. So it's very important to, to be a part of the right network. And uh, already Dev Hargo uh, mentioned some of these awards, but I wanted to say that uh, th this has been a team effort and we have been uh, recognized in various uh, national awards including from our faculty, where the Corona team was given the Innovator of the award, Year Award. Uh, we also received, uh, me and Magna, the NTNU Employee Award, which is given every three years with an innovation and collaboration with business and public sector. We were also part of receiving the Research Council of Norway's Innovation Award, uh, which was uh, cash money, and we are using that now to increase the innovative or innovation potential of our departments. We are hosting some innovation days in summer. And also for uh, Live Scientific, we have been awarded with this establishment uh, fund from Adolfo Jens Fund. It's a prestigious uh, uh, startup fund that you can get uh, based on your uh, interest in continuing and having sustainable approaches. And here the sustainability is within the health industry. And last but not the least, uh, there has been a lot of media attention, both local and national and international media, uh, trying to capture us and follow us through our journey and making us also tell our stories in different formats. And I think 
uh, we had to we, uh, we had more than 150 uh, media uh, encounters in the year 2020 2021 from podcasts radios national tv uh, and also journal and articles as well and uh, there has been two teams the corona team at the department of chemical engineering where i had been the project manager and um, uh, we had people from different nationalities at different levels, master students who got an enormous experience during the Corona project, uh, PhDs, postdocs, and also administrative staff. And then we had a smaller team at the Department of Clinical and Molecular Medicine producing the buffer. And then we had six people from the tech transfer team that was continuously helping us chart business policies, reach out to different market segments, reach out to partners, look at the robust stability of the process, look at uh, licensing, et cetera, and et cetera. And finally, I would like to thank all the inventors who have been part of this process. So there have been three from uh, our side, including me, Anuban, who was a PhD. Uh, at that time, I was a co-supervisor for him at that point. He has now graduated. And Vegar, uh, who has been, uh, who was a postdoctoral researcher like me, and we shared office uh, at that point in time. And then Magner uh, on the ICOM side, Larsh, who is a researcher, and Stan Evan, who has now moved completely 100% into live scientific, and Per Arne, who is also on the buffer side. And with that, I think uh, I would like to stop talking and open up for more questions and interactions with the audience. Thank you. Uh, you can feel free to unmute yourself to ask the questions, or you can uh, choose to drop it in the text um, chat. Um, I want to start with a question, which is uh, which I personally have. Um, Professor Bondobadde, if you could discuss a little more about, um, I, I think most of us are like really interested to know the process, a little bit about the process if possible, which is you have some innovation um, and uh, you work somewhere abroad, which is not in India. Uh, what can be the processes where, you know, you know, visa requirements either or the, you know, funding, how do you secure funding? Is it through the university or is it from the government or is it mostly from angel investors or, you know, some other organizations? Hmm. Thank you very much for asking this question. And uh, I think it will vary quite a lot uh, from, from country to country, I would say. But in general, the process, at least, uh, is that if you have an idea which you think is innovative enough, uh, what, uh, at our university, what we have is we have to disclose this invention. So the, this is called a DOFI form, which is a disclosure of first invention. And you basically write your idea. And, and that's a documentation purpose. And you send it to your, with the team of people with you are working with, uh, who have been part of that idea or part of that project. And then you send it to uh, technology transfer office. Now, what they do is that they call you for an initial meeting where you explain your idea and everything happens under confidentiality. So they are not disclosing this idea to others. And uh, you, you discuss your idea, and then the first thing they look at, or two things they look at, is that uh, patentability, if this idea is patentable enough, or if what's the status of the idea? Is it mature enough or not? Now, if, if, if it is found out that it is not mature enough, then you are able to apply for some funding, uh, which are called, at Antinu, they're called discovery projects. So you can get a short project for six months, or you can get a project up to one year where you basically work on your idea with your team and you try to make the idea more mature. And then at that point, if you, after those six months, which could also be a student project, it could also be an employee project. If you are a student project, then we have different, uh, not TTO who supports them completely, but there is a student uh, office called Spark which helps in, in getting those ideas forward. But if it's an employee project, then TTO offers all the support along with the patentability search. And this process continues. And uh, then after six months, you can get, uh, again, 
meetings all through all during the six months as well. But mostly at the end of the six months, a decision is then made whether this idea is good enough to license it to an existing startup. That's where it starts. So for example, now since 2020 until now, we have submitted seven more DOFIs. That means seven different ideas. And some of these ideas were found to be very close to the core business area of life scientific. So then they call you into a discussion with the startup company and you start negotiating terms and conditions. In this case, it was easy because this is a, this is, it's the same co-inventors and the same founders of the company. So the licensing agreement was a standard one. So you, it, it's an, a royalty basis license agreement. So this technology is then has been now licensed to LIBE and LIBE is doing the second product, which is the production in process. So this has also come through NTNU. In other case, what could happen if it's not a startup, then this idea is connected to other companies, could be, for example, Thermo Fisher, could be other companies, and then it's evaluated. Do they need it? And there are different kinds of agreements that will come into place all under, again, confidentiality if needed. And the third option is that if it seems like, no, this is not but it's not good to license, but it is better to continue working on a startup, then the TTO helps you in uh, getting support, both through national funds, where we have something called Innovation Norway as an organization that provides funding, or through the Research Council, they have some commercialization funds and initial establishment funds. And then the process continues. I think uh, when it comes to uh, external investors, it depends very much on the maturity of the idea. So in some cases, directly you can call in investors, which was not the case in our uh, life scientific, but in many other startups, we have seen that the investors are brought into the picture at the very starting point. So this is kind of roughly how the process goes. I think uh, the names of the organizations would be different in different uh, country settings, but at least the process is quite similar. So yeah, I think uh, that would be more or less how you secure funding. Uh, most of the funds are possible either if you are an employee or a student at the university. I see. Thank you so much for this answer. Um, or anyone from the audience, if you have a question, you can just unmute and ask or you know you can raise your hand and ask um do you have any questions otherwise i have a second question i'll go to that um i wanted to, i'm very curious to know how, what was the history of the name uh Nextra? um what, what is the story there yeah so if i remember correctly it's 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 uh it has got to do with this uh, domain names of different products, what is already existing. So we have a copyright on the name as well now. So Nakstra is basically nucleic acid extraction. So that's why we call it Nakstra. Uh, but we also had names, we had several contenders and then it was mostly a board decision as to what would be the name. But I think uh, this was the one that was found out not to be competing with products already on the market. Did you, did you want to be did you want to be a CTO ever, or you wanted to be more on the professor side? That's a very good question. On a very personal note, I think um, I, I, I did work in an industry for six months before coming back to academia. And I don't think that I enjoy working in industries too much, uh, but this, this one, I think this role I enjoy quite a lot although uh, life has become much more complicated having two different hats uh, and non-disclosure agreements, some cases where I am not able to take a decision just because I have the hat on both sides. Uh, these are challenges that I never thought I would uh, come or encounter so early in my career, to be honest, uh, because it's, you know, you are, you are the person coming up with ideas to uh, run different research projects along with your PhDs and postdocs and master's students. And at some point you feel that this idea can make it to a product. So, uh, and then you have a question of what is the, uh, it, it's ultimately life scientific is a startup. So uh, you never know how a startup's journey would be six, seven years down the line. 
uh, our both mine and Magna's vision is to have the startup as a big biotech company in Trondheim because there is no big biotech company, and it has been uh, labeled as a uh, as a probable unicorn uh, by several investors and innovators in the region. Uh, but you never know because we are always in competition with bigger players, also within Norway. Uh, because, as I mentioned, uh, this has been the heart of beet production for even Thermo Fisher. So there is a lot of competition inside. But what I feel now is that as a CTO, I, I do have a, I have a first privilege of scouting technologies that are already existing in the NTNU environment. And it's a mutually good relationship because a startup will always give back royalty to NTNU, to our department. And as I said, that many of these test kits that were sold later on by the company were a very nice agreement that a part of the profits would come back to the university and would come back to our research. So we are funding research through, through the sales and the company. And, and that means if we are able to do this job well enough, we have an eternal source of uh, external funding that can be circulated for further basic research. So in that sense, I feel that as a CTO, I enjoy the role that I have a chance to scout through new technologies. And, and right now the team is very small. The production team is very small where I have most of the responsibilities. But if our second and third and fourth products in the pipeline are launched pretty soon, we would the team would grow in, in numbers. And if you have secured a good market, uh, and, and we are competing, Corona times was special because we had a product which in non-Corona times or non-pandemic times, in my opinion, would not have been an innovation. It was primarily driven quite a lot by pandemics because these kind, sim, not the same product, but similar products exist in the market. Our advantage is the combination that we have with the nanoparticles and the lysis buffer that is unique but uh, it, is, it is not a difficulty for, uh, for, for more innovation in this field from other companies. So I think as a CTO role, I, I, at this point, I'm, I, I enjoy quite a lot because it gives you new challenges on a daily basis. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I, I still have more of a 100 percentage into new position and a part-time or 15 percentage of a CTO role in Life Scientific at this point. But it's it's completely flexible to kind of switch between the two roles later on, depending on the needs and interests. Wow. I'll encourage everyone to ask questions, more questions. The reason being we uh, it's a it's an uh, it's a unique opportunity to talk to someone who is who is already a researcher um, and uh, well established in his field, also who is a leader. Uh, in the sense, like not only a thought leader, but also who is exploring an industry. Um, so you can ask leadership questions and also, um, you know, research specific questions. Uh, I think we have the next question from Atri. Atri, please go ahead. Hi, Shulalitha. Thank you for the nice talk. It was it was interesting to hear something different from my field. Uh, as a researcher, I mean, in academia, things move rather slow. And I'm always uh, very amazed by how fast things move in startups. Uh, how, how, how does this move? I mean, why is it slow in when we want to publish papers and things move rather fast when it goes to industries? Yeah, a very, very good question. And I think uh, we also discussed this several times now in, in academia and in the industries. I think, as I mentioned, like the product that we gave out as the first generation of beads, when we look back and we sold like the five, first 5 million that we sold were all first generation beads. And we found out that those beads were not the best that we had in the house, but it was working. Whereas when we launched with the second generation beads, they were like my personal favorites, so to say, because they performed, outperformed the first generation. Uh, but they were, to the clinicians and to the diagnostics people, they said they were just working as good as a first generation. So why are you, uh, wh what did you do different, right? And we did like three or four months of research with 15 people carrying out different kinds of research tasks to get that second generation of beads in place. Uh, but to the 
we didn't get so much appreciation from the diagnostics. And, and, and this is something that I think we do a lot in academics. We, and I'm not saying that this is not needed. It's very much needed because fundamental studies are extremely important. Uh, and maybe in this um, video or animation that I showed that there is a big strand of DNA and then we had this small bead sticking to that DNA. I think there would be many people who would do that molecular dynamic simulation to find out what would be the exact structure. And for us, we had two days to come up with that animation. And, and we said, okay, we really don't know how the beads bind. And honestly, we still don't know why our beads perform the best compared to our competitors. Uh, we, have, we have done analysis of several beads, uh, both surface analysis, because in this field, you can easily get to know what is on the surface. Uh, but we, we, what, what we have found out is that uh, there is, of course, a scalability approach that kind of outnumbered the industries at that point in time that allowed us to gain market value. But coming back to your question about academics and industry and the pace, I think in academic, academic world, we do things a bit slowly because you generally don't have this urgency. You know, a PhD will last for three to four years. And even in your PhD, if you're not able to solve the challenge you had, the next PhD will do it or another project will do it. But in the industry, that is not possible. If you cannot deliver a product within a stipulated amount of time, you would lose market. Uh, you would also cause all the shareholders to be unhappy because now we have shareholders in the company. We have investors, which are all, by the way, local investors, meaning that we don't have any external investors. So I think the demand for getting a product out in the market, uh, not the best product maybe, but a working product is what makes industrial life much faster compared to in academics where we kind of want to answer all the questions that we have asked in a specific research field or research domain. And, but I would also, I mean, to your question, what also kind of stimulated me to answer this is that now we have a bit different approach in our research as well, learning from this innovation activities, because we did a lot of reflection as to, uh, we also would in normal cases have a PhD solve all the problems, but now what we do is that as soon as we see that there is a potential, we apply for discovery projects. We immediately try to uh, make a technology and, and start evaluating if this is licensed, if it can be licensed either to live or any other startup or any other company, or can we try to patent it? And as I said, since 2020 and until now, we have submitted seven uh, new ideas to TTO, uh, out of which three of them are now under patentability search, which means that, uh, I mean, this gave us a, kind of a boost to not be afraid of taking our very premature ideas to the technology transfer office. So, so now you have uh, students who are shared between your startup and the, in, and the university? And- Yes, so we have a, a PhD, PhDs and researchers shared. So they're employed by university, but the company is paying for their salary. Uh, and the running costs for a PhD. And then how, uh, what pace do things move for them you, you are trying to? Well, they get more or less, uh, that's a very nice question because uh, both of them started last year. And what we see is that they are basically doing a lot of validation studies of, of the beads with industrial samples or let's say patient samples. And they are industrial samples for us. So they're actually running validation studies and trying to, uh, publish more methods kind of processes than investigating why it is working. That kind of work, why this bead is performing is, are other PhDs working on it who are not connected to LIBE, but the ones working on LIBE are primarily trying to validate a technology and understand if that technology is performing well with different uh, scenarios. Interesting. That's very nice. And, and I had a different question on a totally different... I am not a biologist. I know nothing about RNAs. And my question is, uh, how are you sure that, I mean, your beads will bind only to COVID uh, RNA and not some other type of... Uh... Yeah, I, I have to answer it in a bit uh, superficial way, primarily because of the patentability around the surface of the beads or what we have. But uh, 
the, the easy way to answer would be that we see that it's binding to RNA, to coronavirus, it's detecting coronavirus, but we also know that it can detect other viruses. Uh, so it will bind to other nucleic acids as well, but it's the extraction process then which will differentiate if it is coronavirus or other kind of viruses. So it, it will bind to all nucleic acids, also total nucleic acids. It's not specific for corona. Okay. And so, so I mean, again, probably even you are not, I mean, I don't know if this is the right question to ask, so, but if a virus starts mutating, which this one does, uh, it would still bind because it's still a nucleic acid is. Exactly. So, and in fact, this is the same beads which are now using for the genome sequencing. So if, as you know that whenever a new virus mutates, a, it has a slightly uh, changed genome, uh, the whole genes and everything together, the structure changes, and they have been using it for genome sequencing the same beads for purification purposes. So this, uh, I mean, the beads will not uh, distinguish if it is mutant A or mutant B, but it will extract it. And then the qPCR, or the okay. rtPCR in this case, will distinguish if it is uh, mutant A or mutant B. I see. So it's, it's not your job to distinguish between mutant, between no. variants. No. Ah, okay. So and these said, beads are for sample preparation. I see. RTPC and, and 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 you said you are also trying to look at other diseases. Uh, so for that, you would need some slight modification on your beads to and the buffer. Yes, and the buffer because this buffer. I mean, coronavirus is one of the easiest viruses to open up because it's a uh, it's a lipid virus, so it has a very fragile shell. So that's why it doesn't transfer too much. So you can easily open up before you can extract the genetic material. But there are other viruses, like for example, protein viruses, which have a protein enclosure, they are more difficult. And then you have to have a more harsh buffer that will open up the protein shell. Okay, so the job of the buffer is to reach that, so that you reach the virus directly. Uh, the genetic material inside the virus, yeah. And the will also then specifically bind. So when, you, when we go for new beads or new types of diseases, new types of viruses or bacteria, then there would be improvements and changes needed both in the buffer as well as in the beads. Mm, I see. Yeah. Thank you very much. Best of luck. Thank you. It was very <laughs> nice to see you after a long time. Yes, uh, you were my senior in school. So yes, uh, I, I know. <laughs> okay, you remember. Thank you. <laughs> Best of luck. Bye. This was a great yeah. discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, Shorish wanted to ask the next question, I believe. Shorish, you can unmute yourself and ask. Yes, sir. Uh, hello, sir. I, I just wanted to ask, what were your experience and challenges you faced when we were just giving the final touches to the product and launching it in the industries freshly coming out of the research you conducted? Uh, yes, a very nice question. I think um, I also felt when this process was going on that it would be a, a one-time decision that, okay, this is the one that we want to take as our product. That was not how it happened. We had like, uh, so, you know, these are production recipes for each type of beads. And at that point, when we needed to select the one bead that would go into production, we had 15 candidates and we had to just take one. And the way we did it was mostly based on, I would say, experience and the results that were obtained from the hospital studies. Uh, and, and, and we just went on with it. And later on, we realized, as I said, that the first generation was not the best. So we did three months of more research and improved the first generation to a second generation. And then we were more sure of which recipe we needed to continue with. Thank you so much for that. We have the next question from Totha Gautam. Um, uh, he has put it in chat. I can read it out for everyone. Um, do you think working on the lab-based subject also kind of uh, makes it easy to collaborate with industry? And if so, what should be the initiative for the researchers working in theoretical fields? Such, such research, researchers are usually not very attracted in applicability of their methods, even though those research 
uh, can be very interesting for industry and other relevant areas. So in other words, you know, what should theoreticians do or how should they think like? I think it's a very, very nice question. Uh, and, and I agree to your thought that yes, it made life more easier because our research is lab-based or more experimental, but we also do theoretical studies. What theoretical studies would help us to know is, as I said, among other things, why our beads are performing or better binding to nucleic acids. And we have already initiated several studies to question that aspect. And so it will add more understanding of the process. But on a very, I mean, it's very difficult to say for different fields, but I can give you some examples from our startup uh, environment here. There are several theoreticians who have actually uh, licensed their theories to startup companies. So it's not unusual. And especially, for example, I know that there are some algorithms that people use for uh, based on artificial intelligence. And there is a company which tries to you know, monitor uh, the, the movements of uh, premature babies and, and try to connect them to neural uh, disorders. And there, there, there have been collaborations between the mathematics department and, and, and uh, computers and cybernetics department in order to come up with this theoretical framework. So the idea, I don't think, is uh, if, if whether it's an experimental idea or a theoretical idea lacks the innovation potential. Innovation potential can also be very much in a theoretical work. But then if you, if you are not aware of how you can use that idea, then it is best to uh, collaborate and discuss with people who can take an Take a different look to your theoretical idea, like to apply it to a, to, a, to a certain field. But in general, industries, most of the industries would like products. So as long as you can shape your theoretical idea into a product, which could be as simple as, okay, my theoretical idea gives a better algorithm for doing fast detection of colors or whatever it could be, uh, it, 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 it has to be made into a product. That's important because what industries understand is products and product pipeline. So I, I hope I was able to address one aspect of the question, but it, it, is, uh, it will depend very much on the specifics of the field you are working. Thank you so much, Sororita. Um, if anyone else, you want to ask a question, either drop in the, in the text or uh, you can, Raise your hand and ask. Um, we are actually very reluctant to let you go. <laughs> this is a great chance to chat with you. And uh, we are learning so many things from you, from so many different aspects. Um, I also wanted to ask you one more thing. Uh, what do you think in my, um, the, the amount that I know about these two things, I think that you know, when you are performing in the role of a CTO, uh, there's a huge responsibility in terms of taking calls or making decisions this way or that way. Um, whereas in research, you do make those decisions, but not to that extent. Or whenever you make, that will may not have that much uh, impact on the society. Um, how would, what is your thoughts on, on this? I think it's a very interesting question that you ask. I mean, as a, as a CTO or as any uh, administrative decision maker in a company, you have a lot of, you have taken on the responsibility. So when, when we actually read through the shareholders agreement and the license agreement that we sign, uh, we, we can be hired and fired basically. We are basically working uh, for, the, for the company owners, including ourselves. And, and therefore, there is, there is a lot of uh, stress on the fact that we have to take decisions at the right time, uh, hire the right kind of people, uh, select the best kind of technology. And, and compared to in academics where you do that, like I, I do experience that if you are in more administrative roles in some cases that you take more decisions that are far reaching, but you don't see the effect straight away. So if you do a right research project, Maybe in four or five years, you will see a bit of a direction. Maybe another five years, you will see 
uh, a direction and, and we know that it takes a lot of time. But again, in our field, since we also do applied research, we take nanoparticles and put in a specific applications. Uh, we also work quite closely with industrial partners. So I, I personally feel that on my side, I understand the needs of the industry very differently than, than many other professors in our own department. And, and, it, and I always try to start a project uh, from such a need than answering a basic question. That's again, personal interest and choice of where you want to do your research. But I feel that if we have a question at hand and it also gives me motivation to work and I can motivate my own students to kind of to address that challenge. But as a CTO, I think you also have the freedom to uh, get a lot of help from similar positions. Whereas in, in a, I mean, meaning that you can, there are different forums where CTOs can discuss their challenges. You can talk to CTOs of other startups. But for a professor, I think the more you go deeper into your field of research, you are all alone. You are kind of in your own bubble very much and you can have a kind of a homologue with you uh, working uh, or, but it's very difficult to have the same ideas and the same ways of approaching tasks. So in, in that regard, as a CTO, I, I personally feel that I get more uh, support seeing, because it's not just research decisions. Research decisions would come from research manager, more or less. CTO is more on the technology and the operation side. Uh, and and, and at, at, at times I just say, let's just do it. But then if it falls out, we will also learn from experience and hopefully it is not a very uh, disastrous experience for the economy of the company. Because at the end of the day, what boils down for a startup compared to academia is money. Because in academia, you have an enormous pot of eternal money in the sense that somehow it would be managed. Okay, this project doesn't function. Maybe you get a project from some other department, some other faculty, some other source. But for startups, if your economy is crashing, then your startup closes much before you, you predicted. In this line, I, I wanted to ask, um... Um, so I remember um, once I read this, I think Warren Buffett said this um, to answer to the question that what are your investments that you think like it was like the worst investments? And he said, it's not the investments, uh, it's not from the investments that I made. Uh, it's the investments that I did not make. So I really feel, believe that fear comes in our way um, in doing and not doing things. Um, like what if I fail? Um, particularly in this uh, adventurous journey, I would call this. Um, I was, it was a wonderful journey that you shared with us today. Um, in a very short span of time and the impact that it had on humanity, on, on society, that's uh, remarkable. I wanted to ask how scared do you feel about, about failure or potential failure, particularly in this context, because you have definitely gone through such phases. Yes. Yes, I think uh, I would be very honest. Uh, the technology side of it, I think we were we were very confident before we let it out. And uh, as I said, Magda is a is a professor in this field for more than thirty years. I am a very young person in this field. Uh, doesn't compare to experience as much as he has. And, but then still I had to make a choice for which particular product is going to go out even during the Corona project. And now, and I think I would say at that point, that was my biggest fear. Although they said that we have run close to, I think it was thousand experiments that were run on the, on the medical side, but I didn't understand what kind of experiments they were doing. That, that is a lack of knowledge because of the interdisciplinarity that leads to, uh, I wouldn't say a lack of trust, but uh, not completely understanding what they're saying, right? But they had data and I, I believe those. I think the biggest fear has always been in that regard, the first qualification of the product that we use because everyone was, okay, we have this and this and this, and you now need to make a decision which product will go through. It didn't, it, it, it didn't sound so dramatic as I'm saying now, because I, I remember that it was like a lot of Excel files and data sheets we're looking through. And then we said, okay, these, 15 can be products, let's now go through. And then we, we, we decided on one. 
out of those 15, uh, which was not a very easy decision to make and probably not completely wrong either, but not the best you would have done if you had more time. So there, there was a time pressure around it, which, and it will be always the case because customers come to you now and they want a certain product, they want a certain uh, performance of the product. And if we have that, we can give it to them. Uh, but it also depends on the how, what we have seen is that how they're able to use the technology. We have made videos, we have made protocols, we have sent it to, as I said, all over the world. And we saw really nice uh, differences among how people understood the same protocol and the same video. And so for some of them, it worked. And for some of them, it did not work that well. So that was our second fear, I would say, that even if we have a working technology, what happens if this technology doesn't work out at the hands of the other people? Because it depends on experience and, and also in those crisis times, uh, resources available, right? Because you, you are, many of these labs, which were lying idle, turned into diagnostic centers all around the world that got in people, hide in people, some were voluntary. So that was another fear. So one fear was choice of the product, I would say. And second fear was more on if this would be able to be uh, uh, work, whether it will work in the hands of other people. Have we been able to make our uh, product and technology clear enough? Thank you so much. Um... I know your time is very precious. We will wrap it up. We have a final question from Srija. Uh, Srija, you can unmute yourself and ask. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sulalita, for the uh, wonderful talk that you gave. And uh, like, I had a question, like I'm currently doing VTIT and uh, it's like, uh, is it possible to get internship opportunities from uh, your institution in this level? Uh, you mean in innovation activities or do you mean in, in general internship? Uh, in general, like uh, any project work or any other internship uh, opportunities like uh, if it can be like, uh, is it possible like for from our level, like we are really <laughs> very young uh, in this uh, field and we just do not have any experience at all. But still like, if it is possible, think, then it is going to Yeah, thank you for the question. I think I would be very honest. Uh, we do have uh, summer internships in our department and also last year we had close to seven or eight from the particle engineering center from the company, startup company, and also in general from the department. But I think we have uh, a very large number of students already here that makes it, uh, also international students who come for international masters, uh, that makes it very less likely that uh, they, are, they, they, they are publicized, but it's mostly uh, intake here because it's a two month internship generally. Uh, but if you're very much interested in a specific field, then uh, you can also send me an email later and I can connect to others who might be, uh, who might have an option for you. But for us, I, I know that we are pretty full and uh, given the fact that Corona pandemic has just started to go down a bit here, uh, we are still quite in that sense, uh, hunted down by students uh, wanting to do projects and uh, including this year, we had almost like 15 students try specializing with us. It's, it's a lot for a small uh, group. We are now 30 people around that, but and students are the most important assets that we have, but uh, it's already a lot of pressure. But I would, I would uh, request you to kind of send an email and I can and write your interests a bit and I can also connect you to others who might be looking for interns this summer. Great question, uh, Srija. Thank you so much. Yeah, please uh, drop a mail. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, like, uh, can you just uh, like elaborate? Like, what are the qualities that they like look for in such candidates? Like, uh, in the CV. Maybe Professor Bondabada, if you could, uh, you know, in general, like, say, what are the potential collaborative areas in general, um, either for NGNU or uh, for like. I think uh, they would, it depends a bit on the position. So for example, for live now, they are looking for an intern who would like to do some marketing job 
more or less sales marketing kind of internship, not research. But for the other uh, positions, it varies on the project. But most the, the challenge with international internships is also that after these two months, you will go back to your own program uh, and finish your bachelor's, for example, or your master's. But here what happens is that when we get the students for the summer, they actually stay back with the group for one year doing their specialization project and their thesis in the next two semesters. So it kind of the same person continues their research for over a year, which is beneficial both for us and also for the student to gain some knowledge because two months is, is very small or very short. But I mean, there are other well-established uh, internship programs all around the world uh, that can be more useful, but maybe the deadlines have already gone for the summer. For example, DAD has a scholarship internship program. Uh, there is also something called Mitrax from Canada that is quite a uh, problem. And there are also local or uh, initiatives where you can get funding from the Indian government to go abroad. Also for, I don't know if it's for bachelors, but at least for masters, there, is, there, there are options. So I, I would explore a bit more there. And for, for NTNU, I think there is no uh, unified program for interns coming in. Uh, since that is not so much popularized, but since this is a year of internationalization at NTNU, so we have different uh, promotion agendas every year. This year, it's a year of internationalization, so there could be some opportunities uh, coming up. But I think the qualities are, 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 you won't expect quite a lot from, from uh, bachelor students, but that they have uh, taken some specific subjects and that they know how to work in labs. Uh, if you had basic chemistry labs, at least from our side, if you have worked in basic chemistry labs, then uh, that should be fine. Srija, thank you so much for asking the questions. I, I really encourage you to continue the discussion um, in our JBSPDA forum or dropping a mail to Shololita and uh, talk about it more. Um, Good that you asked the question. Um, if we do not have any more questions, um, we know Shulalitda is a very busy person and we kind of snatched him from his daily activities. Um, um, we will wrap the discussion here, but if you have further questions or some other thread of discussions, feel free to use our Slack forum to ask those questions or uh, drop a mail to the administration if you have any suggestions if you have any particular questions to um, Shulurita. Um, thank you so much for being here and asking the right questions, good questions that led us to really good discussions. Thank you, Shulurita. We cannot thank you enough. Uh, you have encouraged us a lot since the inception of this community. Uh, thank you so it's much. It's a for pleasure. Your... It's a real pleasure to be here and discussing and I'm always happy to discuss more. So. Don't feel, uh, I mean, I have been through the same uh, uh, journeys as most of you. It's no problem to, to ask questions which do not make sense as well. So just feel free. But thank you, Orgo, for arranging this and it's, it's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for the wonderful evening, uh, Sunday evening. Bye-bye. We will send the YouTube link very so soon and uh, post it on our uh, JBS PDF forum. Thank you.